Professor Arthur Bellow, good to see you. I, we have to start with the Bellowgate scandal, of course. Uh, I, I wonder, what was your take on it? Did you take it in a humorous way or more seriously? Uh, a, little bit, a little bit of both is the honest truth. Um, first of all, it was a serious attempt to improve communication with students. So we sent out an student email, um, which is going out every week now. And I occasionally write for it. I've just written something for this week's, actually. So, um, so the intention was good, but someone somewhere in the system, um, and I, I still don't know who it is, and actually I don't want to know who it was, <laughs> forgot to remove the reply all function. So one or two of our students discovered yeah. that they could suddenly email 29,000 students. Um, and how can I best put this? The creativity of the student body was uh, in evidence. So some 3,000 emails were sent to 29,000 people. Uh, you, you, can, you can do the maths. I think that's some 77 million emails were sent. Um, so obviously people got very annoyed because they got 3,000 emails in their inbox and that's the, the serious side of it and we apologise for that. Um, on the other hand, it was a genuine mistake and I have to say that the creativity and, uh, and so on uh, was just amazing. Some of, the email, some of the emails that I read did have me... Uh, oh, so you actually emails. read them? Of course I did. I read some of them. <laughs> I didn't read all 3,000. Um, uh, and so the sort of slightly light-hearted side of it was that, you know, that did trend on BuzzFeed above the great British base. So there aren't too many vice chancellors or provosts that have got that privileged uh, uh, outcome to their name. So there, there was, a, of course, an amusing uh, side to it. So we have removed the reply function now. Um, and, and hopefully, for you as students, you do feel that you're getting really good quality uh, information on a weekly basis about everything that's going on here, everything that's good. It's being opened a lot. That you know, we can we can track the opening, sure. uh, not not to individuals of course, but in general, how many people are opening it, which parts of the uh, my UCL they focus on. So um, and we would like some genuine feedback. We would like to improve all of that. Uh, I'm writing more directly to the students. I, I think I'm writing a column every month or so, uh, and I'm kind of tackling the issues of the day uh, in that column as they relate to students and student uh, uh, activities. Did you see the YouTube video on the, the Bella of, of Hitler's uh, response uh, to the Bella Gates scandal? It. I've heard about well, it. Well, there's a particular... Uh, I, did, I, I haven't personally seen it. Are you sure? Yeah, it's good fun, actually. It's a good four minutes. But, um, well, why don't, you, why don't you flick me the link and I'll watch it. I will uh, How about that? There's a particular line in it, though, which says, and forgive me, that effing Michael Arthur, he sits there like a smart ass, doodling that effing Bloomsbury master plan. So I guess the question is, what is the Bloomsbury master plan? Bloomsbury master plan. Well, Bloomsbury master plan antidated me, and it was an attempt to coordinate everything that needed to go on in the Bloomsbury site in terms of the estate and what we needed to improve. Um, and I've come along and. Um, I've got my own suggestions about some of that. We've made some tweaks. Reality has kicked in a bit about prices, but we have got on with some of the key elements of it. So all of the construction that's going on at the moment, uh, the refurbishment um, of the Catherine, Kathleen Lonsdale building, uh, the changes to the physics yard and the refectory, and then the changes to White House, so the sort of the, the active uh, parts of the process at the moment. It's a huge program of activity. Um, we're going to be spending something like £1.2 billion pounds on everything that we're going to do in the estate. Something like about two thirds of that will actually be uh, for Bloomsbury or close to Bloomsbury campus, you know, in other words, the sort of rather extended Bloomsbury campus, which in effect now goes all the way from Fitzroy Square at one end right the way down to the Grayson Road on the other. But th those are all about improving our facilities for um, what we do, educating our students um, and, uh, and our research and innovation. Now, of course, you are a professor, an academic by trade, and you are the first clinical academic to be leading UCL. How does that change your approach as the provost compared to previous provosts like Mike, M Malcolm Grant? 
Uh, well, I don't, I don't think it changes uh, uh, that much at all. And, and thank you, by the way, for remembering that I am a professor and an academic, because I think not a lot of students actually realise that, because yeah. I don't always use my professor title and give you all my uh, degrees and affiliations and so on. Um, I sometimes just... How many degrees do you have? Michael Arthur. Uh, how many degrees do I have? I have a Bachelor of Medicine, I have a Doctorate in Medicine, and I have three honorary doctorates, one in Literature, one in Laws, um, Not bad. And maybe it's two. I think it's two on the doctorate. Sorry, <laughs> one in literature, one in laws, one from Southampton, one from Leeds. So, so I am an academic. Um, and does it make a difference to be a clinical academic? Well, I'm very proud of being the first clinical academic to be asked to be uh, the provost. Uh, this place is huge in medicine, but therefore I have to be particularly careful about that. You know, I must not, in any way, shape, or form show any preference towards medicine, my own discipline, otherwise I'd be dead in the water um, as a leader of the institution. So if anything, I tend to spend more time on the other faculties and the other disciplines than I do on medicine. But of course, it, I do understand medicine, and that's very helpful because there's, there's a lot of change to go on in medicine, there's a lot of opportunity as well in medicine, and so I can understand that and come behind it when it's necessary. Right. So does it upset you? Because I guess in your role now you're much more of a figurehead. Does it sadden you that there was a time where you joined academia because of the research, because you enjoyed that side of the job, and now you're more of a figurehead, shaking hands, doing interviews? Uh, do, does that upset you, or are you happy to have moved into this space? Uh, you, you can use the word figurehead if you like. I regard myself more as an academic leader. Sure. And, the, and the importance of academic leadership is that I think you can make a difference. I'm so proud each year when we graduate, you know, seven, eight, nine thousand students, however many uh, it, it is precisely now, that we are literally sending people out in the world to make a huge difference to, to the society and societies globally uh, that we, uh, that we uh, live in. So, so that's, you know, that's a huge uh, uh, bonus. Um, uh, and I've always enjoyed it. I mean, uh, it looks precipitate um, and all of a sudden you're the provost. It isn't like that. As you grow up through the system and you take on more and more leadership responsibility, your leadership responsibility spreads out. So I think my first leadership position in academia was running a small research group and then it became research for the whole of the medical school and then it became the whole medical school and then it became a third of the university when I was uh, dean of medicine, health and life sciences in Southampton and then eventually it became a whole university. So, so you, 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 ease, you, you ease into that and obviously you don't progress through that unless you enjoy it. And I, I do really genuinely enjoy putting together the, the sort of estates that you need, the sort of facilities you need to, to create world-class research. I like encouraging interdisciplinary research. So I get my academic fuel, if you like, from different issues. Uh, than the personal research uh, angle. And, and absolutely huge in my life um, has been the relationship between uh, research and education. So I became an academic because I felt that those two things had to be very, very close together. And that uh, you know, students should be very actively engaged in the research process to teach them some really important things, um, you know, critical independent thinking, problem solving, um, dealing with uncertainty, understanding what knowledge is, how it's created. Those are all wonderful moments in any person's life and we can actually make that happen very, um, uh, you know, very uh, spectacularly in, in an institution of this quality. So that, 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 that relationship drives a lot of my thinking. And of course it relates to my personal experience. I, I did my first research when I was uh, a medical student at Southampton and actually managed to publish a paper. Is there any particular department at UCL that you see over the next 20 years becoming like, okay, we have a lot of world leading departments as it is, but becoming exceptional and very exciting in its field? Uh, there's, there's a, it, it would be difficult for me to pick one out. There's a lot of excellence. Impartiality. Just, <laughs> impartiality, absolutely. <laughs> We've just been through the REF process. Uh, we've just been shown where our excellence really is. If you ask me what the really exciting thing is, I'm going to answer it. It's not an individual discipline or an individual department. It's that cross-disciplinary activity. So I, I really am a fan of the uh, grand challenges 
Um, we were talking about this at the senior management team yesterday. In particular, we were talking about new activities that we might put down at the new Olympic Park uh, opportunity. And I suggested that we should, rather than thinking of you know which disciplines might, might, we might approach to do activity down there, why don't we think about that in a grand challenge, multidisciplinary um, uh, context, cross-disciplinary context. So, so I think that's the exciting frontier because that's where the world's biggest problems are. That's the sort of thing that the students are very interested in. Global health would be a good example. Human well-being, uh, you know, issues in, in there about dementia. These are huge issues for the whole uh, world. Um, intercultural um, interaction, um, uh, 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 another area. So, so, you know, many, many different things that we could do jointly that would be really exciting, right at the cutting edge, would have an educational and a research element. That's where I see the excitement for the next one. So, you as your role as a provost, you meet a lot of the alumni of the university. I'm interested which uh, academic or alumnus, uh, past or present, uh, do you find most fascinating or most inspiring? Oh my goodness, that's a difficult question. I knew I'd catch you on that one. <laughs> because there, is, you know, there, is, there are so many that, uh, that are wonderful. Um, one of the things when we were musing uh, about um, our future, when we know that we really arrived, um, and one of, the, one of the sort of scenarios we play is the day that there's a general election and the people walking into number 10 and number 11, uh, first of all, have got much greater diversity than, than you, who usually walks in there. And secondly, they'd be from UCL. So it would be great, wouldn't it, to think of UCL being that influential, you know, a little bit like everyone almost expects the Prime Minister to come from either Oxford or Cambridge. Why? Yeah. Maybe they should come from UCL in the future. So maybe we have some aspiring. I'll uh, gladly prime become Prime Minister. Uh, in, 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 uh, in the audience. So, so that, that sort of thinking. Uh, and that was, of course, buying time trying to think of something clever to say. <laughs> Uh, to the rest of your article. Uh, I mean, there are, there are literally people who are all over the world and they are in very, very prominent positions. Um, very influential people in medicine, very influential people in the business world. I, I think it would be wrong to kind of single individuals out. Um, I think we should just be proud of what, we were, what we're achieving and the difference we're making uh, on a global scale. It's interesting because you were mentioning uh, Oxbridge having the monopoly over prime ministers. When will UCL take over Oxbridge for good? I had to ask. Um, listen, Oxford and Cambridge are great universities. They've been around for 800 years. I, I personally have never quite darkened their doors. Um, and, you know, th they are what they are. We're very different. We're in the big capital city. We're absolutely motoring. We're very nimble. We can change things. We can do things differently here. We've got the governance structures that allow us to respond. We've done extremely well against Oxford and Cambridge in recent years. We could do better, I think, on the education side, and we're pushing hard at that. On the research side, we've overtaken Cambridge for research income. We've not yet caught up with uh, Oxford, but we're second in the country. And in the REF, depending on how you measure it, and there are numerous different ways of doing that. So um, a new way of looking at it is how did we score for our research against the number of people we submitted divided by the number of people we could have submitted. That's got a fancy name, it's called the Intensity Weighted Grade Point Average. We were third in the country for that. We were behind um, Cambridge and Imperial, but ahead of Oxford. Okay, so that's one measure. On another measure, which is research power, which looks at your excellence and multiplies it by the number of people, gives you a sense of the sort of size of the entity and its quality, uh, there are three or four different ways of measuring that. Uh, in two, sorry, three ways. In two of them, we were first, um, and, and, and in the other way, we were second. So when it comes to dishing out the money that goes with that research excellence framework, we should be first or second in the country for the amount of government investment in our research excellence. Now that's incredible. That, you know, we're, re we're really, really proud of that. Now we have to make that sustainable. Um, and that's the task, really. Um, Oxford and Cambridge have been around for 800 years. We've been around for just over 180 or so. 
So we've got a way to go in terms of making us sustainable at the very top level of performance for a very long time. But that is the key objective of my time here as Provost. I, I want to be known ultimately for having played a significant role in keeping us at the top and making that possible. Because I think if we get that right for the next decade, um, then we'll get it right for hundreds of years, literally. So shall we know you as Michael Arthur, the revolutionary? Revolutionary? No, I'm not a revolutionary. I'm a fairly uh, solid sort of guy, and uh, I, you know, I'm looking for academic excellence, but I'm looking for that to be sustainable in the long term. I think it's quite easy. It's not quite easy, it's quite difficult. But you can get to the top, but you've got to stay there. I'm, I'm going to refuse to come up with football analogies. <laughs> But you know, you, you understand this, the sentiment here, right? We've reached the top. Can we stay there, and can we really be as good or better than Oxford and Cambridge into the long term? I think we can. I think we've got the spirit. I think we've got the values. I think we've got the staff. I think we've got the students. So, Thank you very much. And, we, and we've got, you know, we've got the opportunity. So the key issue is: Are we going to grab hold of it and make sure that that happens? And I think we are at the moment. And long may that continue. I'm interested with the election coming up in May. Obviously, the Conservative government, the coalition government, have brought in a vast array of reforms on education, rightly or wrongly. Um, it's obviously a matter of opinion. Who do you, uh, which party do you look at and say, I really agree with their education reforms, or even which party does the least damage uh, to education? Because you don't often hear universities coming out uh, berating uh, education ministers. Students do it quite a lot, but the, the top brass of the university often don't. So I wonder what your opinion is. Uh, just because we don't say anything in public, don't confuse that with not saying anything to ministers, because quite a lot goes on behind the scenes of direct contact between leaders of the Russell Group, for example, and, and uh, ministers, biz, uh, and so on. So. There's contact all the time, and, and of course we're giving them advice. It's quite difficult to answer your question because I'm not yet clear what the education policy is of each of the major parties, or even the minor parties. So um, has the Labour Party decided on its policy? I don't think so. Does that worry you that they still haven't decided? It's because I think, I think the political parties now think that higher education, because of what happened after the introduction of fees, is a bit of a toxic issue. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's not that many votes in it, apart, of course, from the student votes. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what their thinking is. I think it's very complicated for them financially as well. So they're frightened of making statements that then cost a lot of money when they've not been able to put that money in place. So there's some caution going on for those reasons. And I thought for weeks now that it's highly likely that one or other party would come out with a clear set of statements to try and garner uh, the student vote. I thought it might happen, by the way, uh, around the time of uh, the party conferences um, last autumn, but it didn't, and it still hasn't. So we're, we're a little bit in the dark as to what precisely the policy would be for each party, and therefore it's very, very difficult to uh, to, to know who to be supportive of or, or who to worry about. Have you heard of Sir Ken Robinson? I haven't. Sir Ken Robinson gave this great TED talk uh, probably three, four years ago now, which was entitled Do Schools Kill Creativity? And he spoke at great length about schools and universities being rather critical, saying that they killed creativity and they were operating like factories using students to create basically products for employers. And he went on to describe professors as living in their heads and to one side. So as a professor yourself, I wonder, would you agree with that uh, explanation of professors and his uh, critique of universities as a whole? Of course not, no. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what his own experience was. And I, and I, I of course, understand what he's getting at. Um, but I'll come back to where I was earlier in the interview. Um, the British universities generate unbelievably creative graduates. Okay? The rest of the world is incredibly jealous of that. And they're intrigued as to how we do it. And all over the world, people are copying our system. 
So the creativity of our graduates, to my mind, comes from the way in which we teach you and the way in which we encourage you to do your own self-directed learning and to be self-critical. And I'll come back to that relationship between research and education. So no, we're not trying to produce you know, oven-ready graduates for industry. We are trying to produce people who have great value to whatever industry or whatever walk of life they walk into, whether that's uh, you know, politics, social science, um, uh, charitable sector, uh, or, or, or industry. We want people that can help make a difference where they, where they uh, are employed um, and, and, and make the world a better place to live in. I mean, it's a very simple, uh, rather altruistic aim, but that is why we're here. And that is the purpose of a university. And they can drift off. Universities can drift off that mission and be pulled in directions by external pressures. Um, some universities haven't got as much research as we have, but we've got everything that we need to really create those graduates. So my graduates do not fit with Sir Ken Robinson's uh, impression, and my professors certainly don't. <laughs> I'm interested, what advice would you give to students? One sentence, two sentence advice to students on the best way to maximise their time at university? Clearly got to work hard, okay? But also be um, inquisitive, ask questions, uh, be yourself, speak up if you see stuff that you uh, are unhappy about and let us try and improve things for you. Do you have much interaction with students at UCL? Yeah. Because I haven't uh, seen you in the Finney spot and, uh, uh, on a Wednesday night yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, every, every week I go and I'm longing for you to come for it and you don't. <laughs> the, um, when I'm out and about around the university visiting departments, I always make sure that I have a session with students. I always make sure that staff aren't there so students can tell me uh, exactly what they think. I obviously have a lot of interaction with the student leaders on a regular basis, um, you know, uh, in, in terms of the generality of their in interaction but also on a lot of specifics. Uh, we're starting a piece of work now on sport. I've just, the student junior have just written to me about that. I've also offered, uh, and I'll repeat the offer on camera, uh, and, and actually it's in this week's column as well, uh, to do a regular open session for any student that wants to come at least once a term. I offered that when I first arrived. It didn't get organized. It's very important to me that it's not a university event, but it's a student union event. So the students own this, not me. Um, but what I've done in addition in this week's column is I've also offered to have the events team get involved in actually making it happen. Um, may maybe the students' union hasn't got the, uh, you know, enough personnel to actually physically make an event happen on a regular basis like that. Really important that it's chaired by uh, one of the student union leaders, or maybe more than one. Um, and uh, through media like this I'd like to encourage people to come. If I'm out there on the stump and you've got issues that you want answered, uh, then that's the place to come and, and have direct uh, interaction with me. I used to do this in Leeds, it used to go down very well. Uh, I was a little bit depressed at how small the audience was, even, um, even at times of tension, you know, remember student fees and all of that. We organised a fantastic debate, two vice-chancellors, a union uh, leader and the president of the National Union of Students and about 70 students out of potentially 63,000 <laughs> turned up. So if we put these events on, please turn up because we do genuinely want to hear what's concerning you. And the ultimate aim of those sessions basically is for me to understand where students are coming from, um, to improve the place where possible. And also there will be, of course, there will be points of disagreement. Um, uh, but I think we can agree on what we disagree about and we can jointly make statements. I used to do this with the students in, uh, in Leeds, with the Students' Union. We can jointly make statements where we are supportive of each other's position yeah. and being seen to be doing that is, is actually very valuable. So the offer's there, I'm out there. I, I didn't get the, 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 tell me about this circle, what did you say it was called again? The circle? Well, did you say you, you, didn't, you wanted to see me on a... One, one evening in the something or other. I didn't quite catch what you said. Oh, Finning. the Phineas Spot. Okay. Do you not know where the Phineas Spot is? No. 
Oh, I'll take you. You got. You got to come. We'll we'll get a pint together sometime. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, that'll be a pleasure. Um, the given that both at Leeds and at UCL on a much smaller scale, of course, you have experienced uh, some students protesting. I wonder what you were like at uni. Uh, were you the one who would go and protest if you weren't happy with things, or were you uh, more relaxed? Um, I was a medical student. I had my head down. It was hard work. I wasn't much of a protester. Uh, but I think that would probably be the same for most medical students, certainly back in those days, and maybe uh, still the case, I don't know. Um, the, I, I didn't, I, I mean, you wrote to me and said, you know, apparently I'd had lots of trouble with the students in Leeds. That's not my perception. Um, there, of course, there were some issues around the time of fees, and, but that was the same in every uh, university in the land, and I was... Uh, chairman of the Russell Group at the time, so I was particularly in the uh, in the spotlight on the issue. Um, but by and large, relationships were uh, with the vast majority of students were extremely good. I think the same is true here, so far. What would be your funniest or best experience in like as an academic that like you look back on and go, "Yeah, that was good fun." Um, that's a difficult question. Uh, Which cl academia cl or uh, well, the best, the best academic moment of my life um, was um, literally um, developing an ex piece of x-ray film that had an experiment on it that had taken me the best part of a year to conduct. So I, I had had to do a piece of fancy chemistry to put an iodine label on a specific protein called type 4 collagen, but I had to do it in a way that didn't denature the protein. That's quite tough to do, and I tried many different ways of doing it. Eventually, managed to achieve it with lactoperoxidase. And then I was studying an enzyme that I thought would cut the type 4 collagen and be a type 4 collagenase. Um, and that's very important because if you want to remodel tissues, you've got to be able to move the matrix around and manipulate it, um, lay it down digest it, inhibit its digestion and so on. So the ability of this liver cell and this particular enzyme from liver cell to cut type 4 collagen was a crucial issue for me to understand. And literally as that gel came out of the, of the uh, developer, I knew I had the answer because there were the beautiful cut bands, three quarter, one quarter of type 4 collagen and it was the happiest moment of discovery uh, of, my, uh, of my life. Happy moments with students. Um, uh, I've had some wonderful, wonderful moments um, uh, during graduation ceremonies. First of all, they're very happy occasions anyway. Uh, my style at graduation ceremonies is to think that I am focusing on sending you out into the world with a good message. It's a sort of rah, rah, get up and get out there and do great stuff uh, sort of message. And just some of the emotion as students come across the stage uh, is... Uh, uh, is hilarious and I, I went through I went through a, a stage of asking students what they were going to do next and I've had some great answers to that but I think the one that sort of got me the most was I'm going to be a rock star <laughs> I have one final question for you and we ask this to everyone and we're always interested into what the response is Muhammad Ali once said that a man who views the world at 50 as he did when he was 20 has wasted 30 years of his life. So how do you view the world differently now to when you were 20? Oh, much, much, much broader um, perspective. Uh, at the 20, when I was 20, I was concentrated on me, where I was going to get to, could I, could I become uh, you know, a doctor? Very, very, very focused and, and not out there and thinking about the world more globally. Now, in this fantastic leadership position, uh, an incredible position actually and one of the things that, that kind of surprises you when you get in these positions is just how much people listen to you you can begin begin to influence things much more broadly and for the better so um, I'm, I'm, I'm with Muhammad Ali there's a huge difference in, the, in those 30 years except in my case it's 40 but never mind <laughs> we won't tell them that Professor Arthur thank you very much it's a pleasure thank, thank you, you. Thank you.